Welcome to Trekosophy. It's 2013, and we're ready for a whole lot of fun with you folks. Joining me today is our regular panel. Uh, first, we have our technical guru. He has a sonic screwdriver, and he can solve any problem in the universe. It's Chris McGee. Just call me the doctor. And he's still a little bit shaken up by discovering the Statue of Liberty half buried on that beach. It's Brandon Kirby. You maniacs! You blow it up! Damn you all to hell! And he's going to change the world in the future, but only if he can pass his history text next week. It's <laughs> Ben S. Preston McLean Esquire. Station! And I am Bill Allen, a.k.a. the guy in the red shirt. Yay! And, and last week, we were on a, a big topic. Time travel. Now, what we're going to do now for our show today is we're actually going to go back in time with our handy dandy little time machine and finish talking about our topic from last week because we only got it through about uh, halfway of what we wanted to get through about. We handled the basics of time travel. Now we've got to deal with the ethics of time travel. Last week, I think we talked a little bit about the metaphysics of time travel, even though we didn't talk about the metaphysics of time itself, which is which uh, is another big subject, which we probably should do on a specific episode, because there were some episodes that really delved pretty heavily into that, especially on TNG. Yes. Um, anyway, uh, but yeah, we were going to talk about the actual ethics of time travel question. Uh Ben, uh, uh, last week you started out, uh, wanted to start talking first about uh, how generally time travel seems to muck about with uh, free will. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I can really construct a, a much better argument on that at this point. So I think I'm just going to have to concede at least – for the sake of argument going forward in this time travel episode, that you can have free will and time travel at the same time, or I mean, in the same story, at least. Ben conceding a point? Shock! Horror! Yeah, I mean, I think probably as my ethical framework gets more developed... I might come up with a more coherent argument on that, but for now, let's just let's just go with it. Okay. Well, I I will say in, in your there defense, are... oh, on sorry. your yeah, I was just going to say uh, in your defense on your side of things, saying that time travel is antithetical to free will, that does kind of dovetail nicely in with the predestination paradox version of time travel. Yeah, uh, th there are some things about time travel that do seem to break my ethics, but not necessarily on the free will side of things, at least not coherently. Um, there's the question of if you change history, have you just killed all of the people that, that changed? You know, that version of them is now gone. Is, is that the moral equivalent of killing them? What about the people who wouldn't be born because of the change you made? Okay. The original version of no. them is gone because you changed the timeline. So have you killed them all? And if so, uh, changing history would, could make you a mass murderer. Can I inject my argument at this point? Sure. Please do. It's the argument of hubris. Every okay. ancient ethic has as its central sin the crime of hubris. The crime that ye shall be as gods. If you were an ethicist in ancient times and you wanted to make people think about what they were doing as being either right or wrong, you told a story about hubris, i.e. the sin of pride, the sin that you will be God. And as central to the immorality was the thought that you are God and you have command – over variables of that which you ought not to have command over. And so when we contemplate time travel, we think little baby Hitler, you know, lets off that nasty facial hair and not have to look at that for the rest of our lives. 
But in truth, you know, what's the world going to be look, looking like in the absence of that? We don't know. We are pretending to be gods and saying the world will be a better place had it unfolded differently. Had fate not dealt me this hand, things would have wound up in a, in a better scenario for me. And therefore, I'm going to reinvent the past. And I'm going to have this hubris and I'm going to have temerity to reassign the values to those variables. We play God. And I don't think the ancients would be too thrilled with that. It's my two cents. Yeah, I think you're you're right as far as you go. I mean, uh, there's – but here's the trouble. If you could use time travel, uh, it might be argued that you actually would have the power of God, in which case that would seem to disprove a lot of our notions about God. No, 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 no. Um. You would only have his power, maybe not even that, but you would have at the at the very least, at the very minimal, his power. You wouldn't have his knowledge. Or wisdom. I mean, having that goes with power it. without yeah, I mean having power without knowledge or having knowledge without love or having yeah, but love that, without that, power, all these things are useless and sometimes downright detrimental. Well, it, it could be detrimental, but the thing is, it would disprove uh, our Christian notion of God uh, as – well, not just Christian. The uh, Judeo-Christian Islamic notion of God, the Abrahamic notion of God as, as you know, being uh, all-powerful if you uh, had that kind of power, whether you get the wisdom that goes with it or not, uh, that would seem to indicate that there is no God. Oh. Uh, so, that's a bit – I mean there's a difference between having power over time and being all-powerful. I mean there, there's more to God than right. just time travel. So I wouldn't say necessarily it disproves God well, because – it, it may be a, it may be a strong hint in that direction. Maybe or it could just be that it turns out that God really is real and he's a time traveler from 100 billion years in the future who went back in time and created the whole universe. I mean, we don't well, know. That would, but That would disprove the Abrahamic notion of God once again. That would be a completely different notion of God. But it would still be the Abrahamic God. He's – I am the Abrahamic yeah, God. Let the there Abrahamic be light. concept of God. OK. I, I would like to say – I mean I, I like what you guys are saying and I understand the point. It's like there's a downside to time travel. If anybody wants to Google it, there's actually a uh, Godwin's Law corollary to time travel. Huh. Uh, I don't know anyone, if guys... Any discussion about time travel will bring up baby Hitler? No, no, no. That's actually not what it is, <laughs> but that's close. Because uh, Godwin's Law is eventually every discussion will devolve into comparisons to Nazism and Hitlerism. Right. Uh, there's a time travel corollary that says if you travel in time – and change the past, it ends up making the Nazis win. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> that seems to be the general plot device. Oh, we accidentally changed history. The Nazis won. We need to save the world from this global fascism. Go back and fix what we did wrong. So it's it's what you guys were saying about uh, if you things change history. Yeah, things could be worse. But at the same time, one of those famous philosopher guys, might even have been Mark Twain, said um, true evil is to do nothing in the face of seeing something wrong. How's that quote? Uh, uh, the, the evil wins when good men do nothing? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Or all uh, it takes for evil to prevail is good men to do nothing. And yeah, yeah I think that might have been Churchill, but I'm not sure. It's either Churchill or Mark Twain. It might have been Thomas Paine, but those are the two guys you got to attribute quotes to because Churchill was awesome. <laughs> Mark Twain was awesome. <laughs> you know, Churchill actually – true story. Churchill was the first guy who said, I may be drunk, but you're ugly, and in the morning I'll be sober. <laughs> that was Churchill, yeah. really? Or he was he... at some cocktail party, and he met some, some lady there, and uh, my god, you're hideous. Uh, Mr. Prime <laughs> Minister, I believe you may have had too much to drink. 
That may be true, madam, but tomorrow I'll be sober. You'll still be hideous. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. Uh, but anyway, so... I, I would. But if if yeah. if we had the ability to travel in time, and we could change the past, shouldn't we? I mean, to ease yeah. pain and suffering now. No, There's no, no, starvation no, no, no. of the world. Go back 80 years, plant a thousand apple trees so that you've got apples everywhere for everyone to eat now to solve. I mean, things are going to go wrong and you've got to be careful not to try to do too much. Maybe killing Hitler would be a bad thing. Well, it also depends on, you know, we're talking about if time travel were real right now. But if it were, we'd have to know what sort of time travel rules that we established in our last episode that time travel <laughs> goes by. Is it the type where it's wibbly wombly where the significant <laughs> events such as uh Hitler, you know, we can't change that no matter what. You can't kill him or if you did kill him someone else would just take over. Or uh, is it to the back to the future style where you could, you know. There I think are back to the no. future style is the most interesting for ethics. <laughs> and I think Back to the Future style is probably the most common for uh, Star Trek because typically what happens is it's an accidental back in time trip or the bad guys have gone back in time and the good guys get a glimpse right. of now that's been completely changed. Uh, look at the opening to uh, Star Trek First Contact. The Borg sphere right. escapes the firefight by going through a time tunnel. The Enterprise is caught in the wake just enough for their sensors to see, oh, look, planet Earth is now completely enslaved by the Borg. Uh, the Federation doesn't exist. Bummer. The future is – the present is doomed. So it is back to the future style where you go back and change the past, and yeah. usually it's bad guys going back to change the past to kill the good guys before they were born. Or good guys accidentally messing up the past, a la yeah. City I, on the Edge of Forever. Um Right, and, and it's you got to go back and fix it. Now, a, a, as far as the uh, the ethics of, of doing right, doing wrong, changing things, I think that's why in most of these shows they don't try to change things because uh, the, the, the Federation, the, the universe of Star Trek, as Roddenberry presented it, was about as close to a utopia as you could get. You know, we've solved all the big problems. Now we're exploring the universe together, spreading – democracy and goodwill and all the things that make the Federation wonderful throughout the galaxy, usually through peaceful means. We've made the universe a better place. Right. And part of how we got there, it's the entire chain of events. So even though Hitler was really bad, if things are good in the future, then part of it was because we had bad things that we had to learn to overcome. Without Hitler and the whole Nazi regime's evil, people might not have cared so much about genocide so you right. need you need bad in order for the good to actually come out of it i endorse but, bill's argument yes uh, yeah. um That's so sure they're really. always they're always going back in time to save the present to keep things intact to keep it from getting messed up i am kind of wondering if if somewhere there's some neo-Nazi types who are like, we should go back in time and kill Churchill as a baby. <laughs> a villain would not hesitate to go back in time and damn the consequences. All right. So it's an interesting concept. So, so us so, as heroes, well, don't the good guys have a duty to do the same thing? Uh, well, I, let, so. I, I got a... Oh, okay. <laughs> No, Ben, go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say I could introduce the uh, the uh, analysis of how to analyze ethical questions and then apply it to to this uh, thing. Okay. Well, I think this is this is this might be the heart of it here. Um, all right. So, in ethics, um, I think there's uh, probably three or four different ethical systems we could apply to the question of baby Hitler. We've already gone over, what if it makes things worse? That's terrible. Oh, no. But let's assume it doesn't because it's more fun. Let's assume we could go back and kill baby Hitler, and that would actually stop the Holocaust. And we knew that somehow. 
is it still the right thing to do? Right. That 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 is an actual question. Are, are you guys still there? Yeah, yeah. and I think oh, that's yeah. what Bill actually mentioned too. Is we, okay? We still need it because we need to have evil things in the world. Whether or not right. we like well, it. Uh, well, I ahead. agree go with ahead. Bill, but let's assume for the sake of argument, because it's interesting to think about ethics, that Bill's wrong and we actually know somehow that it would actually make things – or it would actually – we would actually be able to do what we set out to do Yeah. for better or worse. We uh, Assume we had the power to know that we could do it. All right. Well, when we're looking at ethical questions like this, at least in modern ethics, there's basically four different systems we could apply. Uh, and these are social contract theory, deontology, or, or in other words, Kantian ethics, regular utilitarianism, you know, just straight utilitarianism, and rule-based utilitarianism. And uh, so let's, let's give a definition of each of these and then try to yeah. apply each of these to the question of killing baby Hitler. So uh, let's do uh, – let's do – Let's start at the top. Social yeah. contract. OK. Social contract is very closely related with my ethical system that is uh, natural law theory. And it's basically the idea that we – it usually thinks in terms of, of living in a society. And it says that uh, when we join in a society, we accept certain certain rules of – right and wrong in that society and that it's uh, – like Socrates argues in the Crito, it's inconsistent of us to once accept those rules but when they become inconvenient to us to then all of a sudden disregard them. Right, right. And uh, so it's the idea that we have to think about honoring our agreements. And so when people say obey the law because it's the law – they're thinking in terms of social contract theory, and they're and posit, in terms of positive law. And there are there is much deeper stuff in social contract theory, like natural law theory and stuff. But that's that's as far as as it goes. Now I think under social contract theory. Oh wait, no, no, I don't apply it yet. Let's apply them one by one after we get through defining them. Yeah, yeah, let's just find them. Yeah. All right. The second ethical system then is. Deontology or Kantian ethics, which is the ethical system of Immanuel Kant, and it is one. It is an ethics that is based on principle. Basically, uh, yeah, Kant has this thing called the categorical imperative, and what he means by that, well, what's it? What's what's an imperative? An imperative is like you should do this or you ought to do that. That's an imperative. A, a, a claim that you have an obligation uh, do a course of action. That is what an imperative is. So by categorical imperative, Kant means the imperative that is at the root of all the other imperatives, right? He means the category uh, – the imperative that if you can fit other imperatives in the same category as it, then they're right. And if you can't, then they're invalid. So that's what Kant means by his categorical imperative. And he, it, for his categorical imperative that he tries to bring up, he, he has three maxims. One is universality. It basically means that if it's okay for you to do it, you have to be able to will that it be made a universal law. So it's only okay to do it if it's okay for everybody to do it all the time. Right. That's universality. The second one is that you must always treat other people as ends and rather than as a means to an end. So never ever lie. Or manipulate other people. That's the second uh, uh, formulation, or, or second formulation of the categorical imperative. And the third one is that you you have to behave as though you're the king of ends, uh, which and this is the one that I always have trouble explaining. This third one, uh, but basically, uh, you have to imagine that if you were the supreme moral authority of the universe. Would you build your universe in such a way that this would be a right thing to do in it? At right. least that's how I'd explain it. But it's 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 hard not to confuse the king of ends one with the universality one because they sound so similar. And a lot of people would argue that all three you know formulations of the categorical imperative are really just one imperative, and that's what Kant does argue. And basically, what this means in the end is that 
we're rejecting all questions of consequences. Anything that comes after doing the act is irrelevant. What matters for Kantianism is only is the act itself right or wrong without, respect, without regard to the consequences. So what really matters, what makes a good act good, according to Kant, is a good motive. And the way you figure out what a good motive is is his categorical imperative. If you can will the things that the categorical imperative says to will or in regard to this action, then it's a right action. And if you don't, then it's not. Is that a good explanation of Kantianism? Does it make sense? It, uh, it reminds me of my first year ethics class. Yes. Uh, so I, had a, I, I did have a question. I know I don't mean to derail it while we're still going over definitions, and I, I, this might make for an editing nightmare. But regarding the thing about it's not about consequences, it's about motives. Right. Isn't the consequence the motive? I mean, when it comes to, for example, killing baby Hitler, uh, your motive is stopping the, the Holocaust, stopping the slaughter of, of six million people. That's a good motive. But if we're ignoring the consequences of baby Hitler's future life, then you're just killing a baby, and that would be Well, bad. I think what you're doing, you're applying it, and we need to do that when we get through the definitions. Yeah, let's finish the definition. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, okay, sorry about that. No, no, I think we should go there as soon as possible, but then go ahead, say your thing. Okay, well, we, I think we should finish the definitions and then do that. Let's Here's just do it def- briefly. Perfectly yeah. valid thing to do, but we have two more systems to get – well, actually one more system with two versions of it, two flavors of it to get through. Then we have utilitarianism, which is classically understood or uh, traditionally understood. It's not a classical system. It's a modern system, but it's tr- it's traditionally understood as the exact opposite of Kantianism. The only thing that matters for utilitarian is the consequences because it's a, it's a form of consequentialism. And utilitarianism is about maximizing utility. It says that the only thing that matters is what courses of action will produce the most happiness for the most number of people. And that's the only thing that matters. Everything else, chuck it. The so needs of the many to, outweigh the needs of the few. Or the well, Yes, but not only do the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, and that, that is a utilitarian maxim in Star Trek II, um, not only do the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, but the needs of the many outweigh everything, every other consideration. So there's no consideration of the nature of the act itself. There's no consideration of any sort of code of honor or uh, internal consistency in your actions or having a good character or anything like that. The only thing that matters is the consequences your act produces. So if you are a complete selfish bastard – but your actions happen to benefit everyone, then you're perfectly okay with utilitarianism and no better than a perfect saint whose actions benefit everyone if they benefit everyone the same amount. Okay? So the only thing – so it's important to understand about utilitarianism how exclusive it is that the only thing that matters is – producing the most happiness for the most people. See, these other systems might like to produce happiness for you know people. I think everyone would like that. But what makes utilitarianism distinct from other systems is its disregard of everything else. Not its regard for happiness, but its disregard right. for everything else. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Next. Okay. And then the last one is still utilitarianism. But it's a utilitarianism that instead of looking at your single individual action and then just figuring out if that one action produces the most happiness, it tries to borrow from the other systems a little bit in trying to say, well, we need to look at living by rules, but we need to judge those rules according to utilitarianism. In other words – you don't go making special exceptions for yourself just because you personally happen to think, uh, you know, that uh, make a utilitarian calculation that this would be better. Instead, what you need to do is think about in terms of rules for society that would make things better if everyone did them, and then uh, live according to those rules rather than, you know, being a utilitarian loose cannon by yourself. So it's sort of a, a more social kind of utilitarianism. Not that it was already pretty social, but it makes it kind of more social. So does that, so does that make sense? 
Yes. I think so. Okay. So those are the well, they all ones. make sense. That's the whole problem, though. They all sort of make sense, but they arrive at conflicting value judgments. Well, like, if we haven't even original... go ahead. Oh, we haven't even we haven't even applied them yet. Remember? Uh, yeah, he's just asking if his description of them makes sense. If we understand what he's talking about. Yeah. Now, now we would get to yeah, apply them like, to time like, travel. Yeah, I'm okay. transitioning into the topic at hand. Now, okay. I think okay. you guys ought to talk a little bit more because I just went on a long lecture rant. So how about each of you – you guys take turns saying what you think each one would do to the baby Hitler question. Oh, good gosh. That's putting us on the spot. Well, well I think Bill could probably do it. He was doing it a minute ago. Well, I can definitely do the utilitarian view because that's the easiest one probably. Okay. There you go. Assuming that we're uh, sticking with Back to the Future style uh, time travel, of course, then yeah, utilitarianism gonna... says absolutely kill that MF because that's going to save so many people's lives. That's going to bring greatest happiness, the greatest utility to millions of people and not just them, but their families as well. Whereas, you know, killing Hitler, who's going to be saddened by that? Besides well, Hitler. Mother <laughs> yeah, Hitler well, his mother, his okay. Three people. Okay, three people. Um, three <laughs> people versus how many millions? Uh, okay, utilitarianism, yeah. there's no question. <laughs> right. um, but yeah. I agree. Right. That's what utilitarianism would say, at least the normal kind. I don't know about rule based, but that that kind. Yeah, I'll let someone else tackle that one. <laughs> well, see, now, now rule based would go into. Um, if I was following the explanation correctly, rule based looked like somebody tried to take uh, the stuff from Kant, the deontology, and the utilitarianism, and tried to slam them together. Which is the rules kind of crazy? <laughs> yeah, but I mean at the same time, it kind of because like the rules are this is what everyone should do. So everyone should go back in time and kill babies that are going to do bad things when they get older. Well, now here's and it, the but, question. If everybody does that, all of a sudden, th there's no babies left in the world, and <laughs> human race dies out. Thank so you, Mark. I think no, no. Not dies out, though, but that's the question. Because a great many of us here on, on this podcast and listening are pro-life. But the truth is, you can extinguish life that has a propensity towards crime. But the problem with that is the hubris, whereby you take it upon yourself to play God and make the judgment. Back to hubris again. Back to hubris. And you say, you know what? I can minimize human suffering, and I can turn human life into nothing but abstract luxury, but in the process of doing so, do I create a utopia or some some nightmare? Well, we already covered uh, unintended consequences. We're here assuming that we can do it and then asking whether we should. We can yeah, do it without – Well, sorry for yeah. challenging your assumption. Well, yeah. uh, we, <laughs> we discussed that we can't know that already. But so we're, we're in hypothetical land here. Okay. Hypothetically, if you make a plan and carry it out, it's going to work exactly according to plan. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we addressed right. already that we probably couldn't know this, but if we just said, "Okay, we can't know," and then hung up, you know, that would be an awfully short podcast. So we're <laughs> we're 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 digging a little deeper on the assumption that we could know somehow, which I understand you reject that assumption, but can you just go with it for the sake of argument to give us a actually an interesting podcast <laughs> <laughs> sure okay fine i can but then ben yeah ben, you want to have an interesting podcast but now all of a sudden you're pro-choice uh you i, I didn't say i yourself. took a position on this no, uh you, i i would just said we we're going to talk about it and we're yeah, going to have this assumption that we could do what we set out to do and now we're going to ask whether we should right i haven't exactly. answered the question yet so you don't know whether i'm pro-choice or not no, but I think I do because as soon as you make the assumption that we can make a judgment whereby here's a utopia because baby Hitler doesn't deserve to live because of our judgment 
of what he's going to accomplish in life, now we say, look it. There's a predisposition towards something heinous, and so we'll extinguish that. Right. We're going to get there, uh, but we... Uh, well, I'm here. We're not we, going to get there. We're already here. No, I don't <laughs> think so. You're, we're, we're leaving out some important steps because, let's see, we've done... We've done... Uh, utilitarianism says, shoot baby Hitler. Okay. We've talked about that. I didn't say I approved of that. I just said that's what one of the systems would say. Now, let's look at Kantianism. Kantianism would tend to agree with what you just said in that it is definitely not okay to kill babies, period. That's not okay. And it doesn't matter that we might create a utopia based on killing a baby because it's a really crappy thing to do. That's all. That's Kant. Kant says, don't kill baby Hitler because killing babies is wrong. Period. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. And uh, so so that's uh, that's Kant. And I, I've said before, I, I rather like Kant uh, <laughs> because he can say things like that. But uh, I'm not sure he's always right. But his and take on things is usually somewhat interesting. <laughs> let me make this Star Trek yet. Okay. Let me make – suppose you're Rasmussen, time traveler from the 26th century. Thousands could die. Millions would die. Would you – no, you're Ben McLean. You belong to – Plan Parenthood on. Would you advise Hitler's mother to have an abortion? Uh, well, I'd say no. And the reason I'd say no is, well, okay, I guess I need to apply a. a, a well, here's the thing. Let me. I, I hate to interrupt, but he, here's the thing, Brandon. You're asking what each of us would do personally if the choice was ours. Or at least you're just asking Ben, at least, what he would do if the choice was personally his. We're not really trying to get our personal ethics into it. We're just trying to look at it from those four ethical perspectives. We need to finish oh. doing that and then go on to the next thing. And I think we're almost finished. Rule-based utilitarianism would probably say no only because we can't have a whole bunch of people doing their own utilitarian analysis with a whole bunch of time machines and making and then going back and changing everything because then things would just get really confusing. You just couldn't live in that kind of universe. Everything would just be – it'd be like the end of Back to the Future, the game, if anybody's played that. It's just, don't, don't spoil it, please. Yeah. <laughs> play Back to the Future, the game, and go to the end. I've started game. it, but I haven't finished it. All right. So, uh, so, so like parallels so, where you see all those enterprises or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty <laughs> much. That'd, that'd be like, and, and that's just too crazy. So, so you with utilitarian and just says, you know what? We need to keep our calculations simple. Just say no to time travel. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. Social. And then the last one is social contract theory. So, now, what we have to ask in social contract theory and applying it to time travel. The, we have to ask this anytime we're applying social contract theory, but especially now, what is the society in question? Is it Germany? Is it the world, like the human society or community or whatever? Is it the society of time travelers, other time travelers, and maybe rules that different time travelers might have made, like the temporal prime directive? might be something that the that social contract theory would look to. Uh, but social contract theory has a real hard time with time travel because it's hard to identify what the relevant community is because the community could completely change if you change history. So um, social contract theory is very hard to apply in this situation. But here's a derivative of it that is mine, which is the uh, natural law theory, which is very closely associated with social contract theory. And here's what it says. Natural law theory – says that every human being has free will, has rights to self-determination, has a right to life, and is not responsible for things they do in the future. Can only be responsible for things they've actually done. 
natural law theory then thus would say don't kill baby Hitler because baby Hitler is not the murderous dictator that has gone and killed all those people. Baby Hitler That's is true. innocent. Okay. So, so three out of so four systems say no. So actually, well, yeah, no. except I, I think looking at it in that quantitative way is is uh, not quite the, the right way to go. It only takes one good argument to establish the truth of something. And if the other arguments are bad, then uh, there you go. So uh, the number of them doesn't tell you anything. It's a valid thing to say, except that just be careful with it. You know. Yeah, Don't. no, I mean, I understand that. But at the same time, I mean, these are complex issues. And, I mean, you've just shown how everybody's looking at it a different way. And, and it's, it, it's hard to say that, uh, you know, Kant was necessarily – always right and rule-based utilitarianism is not going to be right i mean now any well, of these aren't the only four right there's other ethical systems other oh sure rules. there's virtue so you know we're just p picking four out of the hat here right that oh. seem to cover a wider spectrum of what yeah so those are more four common those are the four you'll normally run into in ethics class. There's another one, virtue ethics, which says you should do the kind of thing which a good character would lead you to do. And okay, I, well, let's I think not get into all that. Okay. And that, of course, that would probably say, you know, you can't really kill a baby because it's killing a baby. Yeah, except it depends on what kind of character, what kinds of virtues you're trying to cultivate because, you know, Klingon virtues would say, heck, do it. Okay. On that note, I know we're just about out of time. And yeah. I, I think we've done uh, pretty good for laying a foundation. This season, we're not going to do every episode on time travel, but there were a lot of time travel episodes. So now when we go in episode by episode, we have this base to look at what Kirk or Picard or Voyager did in a given situation. Did they make the right call? You know, and actually we have already established a foundation for time travel. To discuss it as it relates to future episodes. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think oh, that's yeah. what I'm going for. But there is one thing I would like to mention because, I mean, just kind of like a, a final thought. Throw it out there because we never got to talk about Evil Kirk and the Whales. I'm going to make this real quick. Um, Star Trek Four: to Voyage Home. A evil space probe uh, comes to Earth and it's blasting the oceans trying to talk to the whales. And the whales are extinct because – in the 80s, we were whaling and overfishing, and we had wiped out the whales. So the crew of the uh, HMS Bounty has to go back in time, steal some whales, and bring them to the future in order to save the planet. Why couldn't they just go back in time and encourage people to save the whales? Because there was a movement to save the whales in the 80s. And – then they wouldn't have had to go back in time because the whales would have been there. I mean, it would have. I'll answer that. It would have taken too long. Wouldn't have fit in a two-hour movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that was just the, that, that was just the thing that got me. It's like because when you start thinking about it, there are a lot of species that are extinct, and we might want to have them around again. So if we've got time travel, we just hop back in our time machine, steal something, and take it to the future. So. What if this is why species are going extinct? Because Kurt came back and stole a couple of breeding pairs of whales. That eliminates their kids and their kids' kids and all the, the way the whales would spread out and reproduce and multiply. Going well, back you see, to that about changing history. Some morning we're going to wake up and there's nothing left in the past because it's all been stolen. The or the Langoliers got them. Got it. The bees are disappearing and nobody knows why. Yeah. <laughs> That's like a real thing. Uh, some who was it? Was it Einstein that said, uh, "If the bees go extinct, mankind will follow in five years" or something? Yeah, um, though, I mean, we are in serious trouble if we lose the bees. And we're losing bees. Not the bees. People have talked about the fact that there aren't as many bees around as there used to be. There's this. I'm whole not kidding. I'm not kidding. I'm serious. The, the, this is this is not a joke. The the bees are are serious. Well, uh, they they pollinate the plants that give you the oxygen so you can breathe. If they die, we're in serious trouble. Right. That's the that's I mean it's and nobody really knows what's causing the extinction of the bees. Is it climate change? Is it some kind of natural weird thing where because there have been extinction events in past history where you have millions of species 
and then you have thousands for a little while. Well, we lose about 25 species a day right now. Wow. Right. And, Except and, most of them are boring, though, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> They're not whales. Yeah. Um, which, bring it back to whales real quickly. Um, bring it back to whales. Yeah, sorry. If they had followed your advice and just tried to convince everyone to stop killing whales, well, first of all, they wouldn't be successful. I don't think they, they convinced the whole planet to stop hunting whales to extinction back in the 80s, unless they used their bird of prey to you know intimidate them. I don't know. But I kind of agree with what they did do is take that pair of breeding whales to the future where now mankind has realized its mistakes and they're better for it. They're not – you know, now that they have this pair of whales here, they know not to hunt them to extinction. Right. So you think Kirk did the right thing by, by stealing an endangered species? I think so. Because okay. at the time that he stole them, yes, they were endangered, but they weren't extinct yet. But they were going to be extinct anyway, whether he had stolen them or not. Okay. So uh, that, that, was just, that was just like a little teaser because it's always been in the back of my mind. Wait, they're an endangered species. He's the reason they went extinct because he's stealing them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. He, <laughs> he reduced the population of whales on the planet. That would be the predestination paradox species. then. Okay. Right. It, it was just <laughs> – I mean, don't get me wrong, uh, Kirk is, oh, Captain, my captain, but sometimes you got to call him out on some of his calls. Oh, a lot of them, but yeah, that one I think I agree with. Okay. But I figured that, I mean, it's, but, but I mean, there were so many great time travel episodes. Some of them were about rules. A lot of it's about fixing what went wrong. One of these days we should sit down and compare and contrast Voyager's involvement with time travel compared uh -huh. to Enterprise's involvement. And I mean, uh, Captain Archer's Enterprise, because those were two very different organizations from the future that were mucking about in the timelines. I really hate Enterprise, but I loved the concept of a temporal Cold War. Just as a as a science fiction, it just didn't end very would be, well. Yeah, they would be writer. I, I loved the concept. I just didn't love having it in Star Trek where it doesn't belong. Well, I mean, it would have been great. Uh, the thing that made Enterprise, it had a lot of brilliant concepts that were just poorly executed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And, well, that's a topic for another time. Probably. Yes, yes. And, and I'd like oh, to... we've done it before, though. <laughs> <laughs> Has covering, anyone ever noticed around. that on Star Trek, it seems like Every time traveler comes from the 27th century. Go back and watch the episodes. Uh, Picard Mr. Houston was purportedly from the 26th. I think. Was the 26th? I mean, he was from like the 21st, but he'd stolen a yeah. ship the 27th. Or I thought it was 27th. It might have been 26th. I can't but remember. I have to go back and watch it. That now. must be You're, where uh, the Legion of Superheroes lives. Your your temporal prime directive agents always given Voyager a hard time. Twenty seventh century. Oh yeah. Uh, the two alien bounty hunters interrupting Picard's vacation on Risa. That is vacation. Twenty seventh century. It's like <laughs> everybody who travels in time comes from the twenty seventh century. Well, I was saying that must be when the uh, when the Legion of Superheroes lives. You know, they're like the future version of the Justice League, and every time Superman has to go into the future to save the future, you know, it's this future version of the Justice League that comes to get him. It's the and Legion it, of Superheroes. That must be when they live. Time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you want to yeah. take us out, Bill? I think we lost Kirby. He's halfway in the bottle now. Well, uh, not quite there, but I'm, I'm making my way. <laughs> we can keep right. going. I'll get there. I think we were yeah, about out of time. Yeah, we're... We'd need a time machine for that, Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. On a topic about time travel, we are out of time. But uh, we've laid the groundwork, and when we go to the future, we'll be able to cover these topics more thoroughly without having to rehash what time travel's all about. And we've got a great start to a new year. Thank you all for listening. I'd like to thank our host for joining us this evening. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, 
check out our webpage, trekcosophy.com. Drop us an email at trekcosophy at gmail.com. Check us out in the iTunes store. Leave us a review. Send us some feedback. We want to hear from you, and we hope you enjoy hearing from us. And if you meet yourself in the hall, just go with it. <laughs> yes. And we'll see you. Damned dirty apes! <laughs> you blew it up! <laughs> in the future, things will be different. We will be free. And there will be more Trekosophy. Join us next time. Well, there you go. <laughs> Now that the show's wrapped up, can I rant for a minute about Batman? <laughs> <laughs> Bill, I have to say, you're an indispensable all-purpose geek. You're, I you're try. a fountain of information when it comes to nerddom. And I really don't think the show would be the same without that fountain. Well, I think what it is is I'm a nerd and not a geek. A nerd generalized as a geek specializes. Okay. So... If I go head to head with a Star Trek geek, the Star Trek geek is going to know more than me because I'm just a Star Trek nerd. Right. I'm a tr- yeah. I'm a Trekker. He's a Trekkie. I'm a Trekkie. Yeah. You, you guys wonder are- what sex in a zero G suit is like. I wonder what sex is like. That's the difference between the two of us. I have theorized that a lot of dumb philosophy gets done because the philosophers are too drunk to realize how stupid their arguments are. No, that's just but- Kirby. <laughs> You know, I'm starting to grow envious. I want to start drinking before I do this show. Yeah, I'm beginning to think I need to as well. I'm from I, I'm from Eastern Canada. I don't do language. Eh? Oh! Saw the previews for Evil Dead. What's Evil Dead? Oh, I, I forgot. You guys are just Star Trek geeks. You're not multi-purpose geeks. Here, I'll even wear headphones just to... Just to up the ante so nobody can hear Ben McLean twice. Nobody should have to hear Ben twice. No, that's... I wouldn't wish that on my... Yeah, you get the idea. Okay. I'm well, feeling love in the room tonight. Hello, We didn't hello. have someone interrupting us all the time. Oh, hello, Bill. You know, I just had to say hello right when you're talking about people interrupting, too. Boy, do I feel bad now. <laughs> the ethics of microphone usage. Here I go. Oh. It's like, wow, these guys make me sound good. Ben said not to start without him, so we're going to start without him. You guys are going to send me down on the planet, just me in a red shirt for this. Uh-huh. That's funny. I've had half a glass of whiskey. I'm ready to do it. Oh, more. no. Here we go again. And by half a glass, I mean half a bottle. <laughs>